Hello and welcome to the Cricket Podcast with me, Jack Hope, Ross Legg. Hello. And Matt Troy Brown. Hello. It's a very special episode of the Cricket Podcast this week. We've got David Gower on the show for, for a long interview. Yeah, and it's also a man who needs no introduction, so I don't think we're going to uh, dwell on the intro. Um, but you can find us on Twitter or Instagram at the Cricket Pod. Um, as always, leave us a review on it on iTunes, um, and also share it with your mates. This is David Gower we're interviewing, and he shares everything from talking about the apartheid through to his playing days, captaining England. Like it was an absolute pleasure. Um, how did you find him, guys? Well, I mean, like it's it's Lord Gower. Um, it, was, it was an absolute privilege to, to speak to the bloke. Um, uh, probably, for me, the highlight of doing the cricket podcast. I mean, not even close, is it? There's nothing else that <laughs> even shines a, a light on uh, on talking to David Gow for an hour and a half. All right, gents, let's not try and diminish the guests we've had had on or we could have on in the future. Like, it's, it's, it was great having you all on. Thanks, but no thanks. And by the way, any, anyone who comes on in the future, you're not going to be as good as David Gower. I mean, yeah, 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 Ross. Um, Shall we just play the interview? Absolutely. Shall we play a game of village cricket? Yeah! On the show, we are joined by a man who played over 100 tests for England, scored over 11,000 international runs, captained England, and as a slightly younger generation, um, read us, uh, will know him, has become one of cricket's leading broadcasters. Welcome to the cr- Cricket Podcast, uh, my favourite aerobatics enthusiast. How are you doing, David Gower? Uh, well, I've just come back off the, the latest edition of aerobatics. Um, in fact, I can honestly say that I was looking at footage of the recreation of the Tiger Moth thing from 1991 that we did about eight years ago on the last Ashes tour that I was allowed to work on. And there is some brilliant, brilliant footage of this Tiger Moth fitted up with cameras, you know, properly by Sky, who did a really good job on it, doing the aerobatics. We didn't actually do the first time round. First time round was basically um, flying across the ground, down the line of the pitch, um, 150 feet. So he's a little bit lower than the equivalent of our Civil Aviation Authority allowed those guys in 1991. They got a bit of a fine as well. Uh, so that was quite straightforward. You know, it was a couple of, couple of buzzes at the cricket ground, quick bank left, turn left, over the beaches of the Gold Coast, have a little look at them, come back, land, and think, well, that was great fun. Surely nothing can go wrong. Anyway, you can be wrong about all sorts of things, including <laughs> the fact that you know, no one might get upset. So, yeah, it was, it was a topic of conversation a couple of days ago. Um, it still remains... It seems a popular story. Um, it still remains one of those things that I look back on actually quite fondly, despite the fallout. You know, despite the you know, 18 months not playing test cricket, that sort of stuff, um, I still look back on it quite fondly. Well, it was a unique endeavour, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> I, I, I think besides, well, you and John Morris, I'm, I'm not sure anyone has uh, had a, um, a forced 18-month hiatus from the game because of uh, an, an aerobatics incident. So <laughs> yeah, I, I think John would say that his hiatus has lasted something like, where are we, 90, uh, 20, 30 years now. But <laughs> his, his hiatus is probably slightly more um, inflated than mine. But um, it was, yeah, it, I mean, you're right. I, I don't think anyone, uh, there are no records, even since Roman times, of people doing the same sort of thing um, anywhere over an international sporting event. <laughs> there we are. What do do you regret not releasing the water bombs? Uh, well, we didn't have any. I mean, there was. This, <laughs> so is that that's not true then? This, well, no, this is one of those things. It was it, it was probably one of those things that was mentioned at the time. I wonder what if. But actually, we didn't have any water bombs. And if we had, um, Bruce, my pilot, because as you know, everyone in Australia is called Bruce. Um, <laughs> Bruce would have been averse to that on aviation grounds um so we wouldn't have done that anyway but the <clears throat> as i said we didn't actually have any so no problem we I mean the, the only water bomb incident i can remember is going back goes back to india 84 85 when i was captain in india and we had a a night in 
where was it Hyderabad during a zonal game where we sort of made our own fun basically with a bit of a sort of what they call they, they call them shikaras which are basically Indian gondolas mm -hmm. a bit of a race around the ornamental fountain in the lake we had people up on the roof of the hotel which is six seven stories and we had Graham Fowler and Pat Pocock on the roof with oranges and water bombs who were bombing the paddling you know, so the the gondoliers out on the on the artificial lake there uh, and the only problem there was that one of the water bombs kind of exploded too early, sort of. So it dropped on the terrace below, which was open air dining. <laughs> <laughs> and it took by surprise, I can tell you this, it took by surprise, there was a Swedish scientist who was staying in this hotel in Hyderabad, a very eminent person, very serious person, who had this thing landed right next door to his table. It, it does make a hell of a noise and it takes you by surprise. So we had this thing where uh, when we got back from this gondolier race, basically, uh, and it was carnage, absolute carnage. Um, we got back from this, and I was all tapped on the shoulder by the hotel manager, who said to Mr. Gow, yes, um, we have a slight problem. And he explained the situation, water bomb falling, you know, very, very, um, very angry scientist um, who'd like to know who's in charge. I said, well, that's probably me then. <laughs> so I went to see said Swedish scientist and apologised profusely, and he said, well, I'd like the authorities to be informed. So I said, I'll do that straight away. So I wrote a letter to myself on MCC headed notepaper, note, note paper from the, you know, borrowed a typewriter from the Daily Mirror, uh, borrowed some notepaper from the manager who must have been Tony Brown, I think the late Tony Brown now. So I wrote a letter to myself saying this is disgraceful and action must be taken, handed a copy to said Swedish scientist. Um, and we ended up, I think, paying the damage to these shikaras was 50 quid so it's, you know, it's lots of rupees it was about 50 quid so okay, right sorted done that so by you know, 11 o'clock that night the whole thing was was sorted um but that's the only time i've really had to to do exactly that i think oh, there we are um moving moving to to well to your actual cricket um mm -hmm. You make the game look so easy. I've, I've spent a few days looking at uh, a couple of the Roe Belinda compilations of some of your centuries and mm. um, your double century. Um, you made the game look so easy. Uh, on the flip side, we make the game look so hard. Um, what, what's your secret? Um, smoke and mirrors. Um, actually, those, yeah, those Roe Belinda, Roe Belinda, whatever, they, they are very good, aren't they? Yeah, excellent. I mean, yeah, I, I've, yeah. you know, over the last two or three months, looking at Twitter and stuff, where they all seem to appear as if by magic. Um, I've been able to watch yeah, myself, but all sorts of other people from that same sort of era, 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, it's, a, it's a brilliant collection. Um, and I'm very glad that they managed to, to have it, when it was shut down by Twitter, yeah. that Cricket Australia realised, actually, this is, this is gold. This is, you know, this is great PR and all the rest of it. And they put the right sort of pressure on to open him up again. Um, that sort of nostalgia, I think, is very, very healthy. Um, and when, for instance, when I used to be at Sky and all those things they did on the great players of that same era, 70s, 80s and beyond, when you see those sort of half-hour profiles of people like Viv Richards and the rest of them, and you realise how really, really good they were and you know, how good they would be in any era. Um, you know, even so, you know, my sort of now, sadly, ex-colleagues, people like NASA, others, uh, you know, NASA would say, oh, I'll just watch this on, you know, on Viv or it might be, God, he was good. Mm -hmm. And actually, it's, it's a really good thing to be able to see all that footage, um, you know, and if, whether it's three or four minutes, five minutes, whatever it might be, just to sort of be reminded how good these people were. Because we're in an era where there are some fantastic players, which I fully acknowledge, and they do some extraordinary things. I mean, you know, that last, um, you know, last year alone, you know, some of the things we saw in the Ashes, uh, the World Cup, World Cup final, all those things were just extraordinary. Um, and so, yes, you can, you can enjoy that in the moment, but I think it's just a really good thing to be able to look back a bit further and be reminded that we weren't too bad. Um, if there was the same sort of footage available from say 20 years before that, you know, that, that'd be even more interesting to sort of look at the people I was watching when I was growing up. So, so the, all the previous generations or the Peter Mays, the Colin Cowdery's, all those people who were extraordinary players in their day um, and rather different players to the ones we would see today. Um, but no, yeah, anything like that at the moment has been gold dust, absolute gold dust. Yeah, no, have, you, yeah. have you broken out the um, Ashes 2005 box set like probably most cricket fans have? <laughs> um, actually, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, actually, no, I mean, again, classic, yeah, great classic series. 
Uh, I suppose, I mean, I have, right, selfishly got fonder memories of the series we were involved in. Um, mm -hmm. So, for instance, where, um, you know, next year is the 40th anniversary of the 81 Ashes, Beefy's Ashes. And we're already planning um, to put on, you know, the odd event uh, to mark that, you know, get, get, some, get most of the guys back together again if possible. Rematch. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> um, we don't want to... No, no point having a rematch. You know, we just, we just win. It's as simple as that. Um, but, I mean, that... Because, I mean, that is... Tell me, because you can... You can I, I love these discussions. You know, 2005 was really, really special. Um, let's face it, 81 um, was probably... I mean, quite probably, arguably, an even bigger turnaround compared to 2005. At least 2005, the fight back started in the second test match. You know, in 81, we'd already you know, come second by a distance in two. Um, you know, we, we were looking very, very poor indeed. And, uh, and the fact that we should really have lost Headingley, we should really, we should have won, Manchester was fine, but we should have lost Edgbaston. You know, and yet, just on in the hands of Almost one man, not quite. You know, the, our, our dear late friend Bob, Bob Willis, obviously had a major, major hand in what happened at Headingley. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, again, without him, you still don't get a win. Um, but you know, Beefy made his reputation that year, and you know, the whole thing that followed, you know, sort of the uh, extraordinary development of sort of you know, sort of this comic book character, um, you know, boy, you know, boy, sort of the sort of the the infamy, the the fame, the whole thing that Beefy then. Engendered for the next ten years or so, uh, which still serves him well now, of course. Um, but that was that was the entire turning point. You can imagine, you know, you imagine sort of the sliding doors thing, um, which sort of leads us to Gwyneth Paltrow and all the rest of it. But if you imagine sliding doors on that summer, you know, if Beefy had gone to Headingley and you know, had a bit of a slog and got out for ten in that second innings, um, you know, where would we be now? Who knows? None of us might be here. <laughs> <laughs> just, um, just on that, and this is this is away from our pre-agreed set of questions. Mm. So sorry, mm. boys. Um, mm. What what's it been like to spend what the best part of forty years, forty five years playing cricket and following cricket with Ian Botham? Ah, uh, oh, good question. Um, in the the first part of that question, if you, up until you get to the point with Ian Botham. Um, <laughs> The, the easy answer is brilliant. You know, the, the whole thing of being, you know, going from school, sort of breezing through a sort of almost aberration of six months at university, throwing one's lot in with cricket, enjoying 18 years playing, 20 odd years broadcasting, brilliant. A lot of that's been with Ian. And uh, as everyone tends to say about Ian, quite rightly, he's a very loyal friend. So he's, he's, he's a really good man to have around you uh, if you need a bit of moral support. He's a really bad man to have around you if you want to have a quiet drink out. <laughs> um, you know, so he's entirely suited to his latest career of basically peddling alcohol <laughs> in vast quantities. Um, no, he's, 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 you know, he's a great man in many, many ways. Um, and I can, I mean, I suppose it's like there are a couple of things, a couple of phrases I used for describing both the cricket and the lifestyle. Uh, one is talking about the cricket, you know, against sort of the, in that era of West Indies fast bowling and stuff like that, you know, there are, Half a dozen balls I've still not seen from people like Michael Holding, Sylvester Clark, and Malcolm Marshall, and those sort of guys. And the other thing I say to people is that there are sort of three or four days I can't remember, which followed <laughs> night downs with you know, Siri and both of them. Uh, dare I say it, completely impervious to pain or any sort of side effects of alcohol and the rest of it. Um, I mean, I, I've spent days feeling near death or feeling that you know, death would be the preferable option. And he appears to have absolutely no visible signs of pain or anything else. You know, he's it, it, an extraordinary character. Look, what, what was that like when you were in kind of the, the Sky commentary box? You've had a skin for the night before. You're in a tiny little enclosed space. In, in comes Boat Beefy, in comes Mike Atherton. Well, you're sitting there going, Who, who's the one who smells of booze? There's all three of you. Uh, well, I, uh, yeah, I mean, there was one... There was a there was a, a tour of South Africa some years ago now where we had we got to the one day internationals. There was one in Johannesburg, followed the following day by one in Pretoria, Centurion. And I remember it horribly. The, the the sort of Saturday night in Johannesburg, and I sort of rang Beefy up and said, "You you doing anything? Should we sort of grab a you know glass of something and something to eat and you know, early start tomorrow?" So just a quiet night. He said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, fine, perfect." Met him in the bar. 
and there are all sorts of people like Mike Proctor. And it's one of those nights where people just kept wandering in. He said, oh, I'll have a drink. And, and then the bar closed. And you hadn't, you hadn't eaten more than sort of a, you know, half a packet of peanuts. And we sort of went upstairs and thought, well, we just better have another drink just to finish off with. And somehow the, the, sort of the night disappeared. So Beefy then drove us from Johannesburg, from the um, from Samson in Johannesburg up to Centurion, you know, 40 minutes uh, without batting an eyelid, you know, parked up. I felt dreadful. <laughs> I mean, I, I sort of wandered in, thought, oh, I can't do it. I mean, in, the, in those days, we were, this was Sky with a guy called John Gaylard from, he used to be at Channel 9 in Australia. And I was told, can you go and do a pitch report? So you stick your earpiece in, backpack, you know, sort of battery pack on. Centurion has about 75 steps, each of which felt like about a meter high. <laughs> and I eventually got down the field, staggered across the pitch. In my ear, someone says, you know, right, right, go, you know, go for it, mate. I said, okay, fine. So I said, yeah, well, uh, welcome to, um, where are we? Centurion, okay, fine. Um, um, let's have a look at this pitch then. Sort of managed to get down onto my sort of haunches and said, uh, yeah, it looks pretty good to me. Back to you. <laughs> <laughs> And I, and I got this got this voice in my ear from this, this fellow John Gaylord, who was an uncompromising Aussie, very good man, very good director. I said, "Well, I guess that's as good as it's gonna get." <laughs> I said, right? Can I go now? So I then sort of staggered up these stairs again to get back up to the level where the stands were, the commentary boxes, and spent you know the first commentary scene was an appalling effort. Um, and eventually, someone said, "I think David needs to go home." So I was sent home <laughs> to the hotel. Um, but Beefy and Procky, who had you know, been, been there alongside us, or alongside me all night, yet yeah, no one would have known there was anything wrong. So they just did the day's work, carried on talking the usual stuff, um, you know, came back that night, said, how are you? I said, I'm pretty bloody awful, thanks. I'm <laughs> yeah. I slept for about 14 hours. So, I mean, that's um, the simple truth is that over the years, we sort of kind of worked out a system within where... Um, he's always had people that want to have a drink with him. He's always had things going on. He's always been very good at um, you know, finding events to go to or you know, things to do. So you kind of share him out. Uh, and that works for him and that works for us. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, Beefy's garnered a bit of a, a reputation and it sounds like it's somewhat justified. <laughs> but, um, I mean, back to, you know, back to cricket and, mm. and you yourself kind of got a, a bit of a reputation for uh, coming across as quite laid back on the cricket pitch I think mm -hmm. um, a lot of people people have said that um, is that do you think that's fair is is that a, is that a true uh, a, sort of a true assessment or is it just just how you came across it's a half and half thing um, I always in all honesty it was a sort of it was a bit of a construct because if you're going to you know, walk out to bat at Lords, Sydney, Melbourne, Calcutta, Mumbai, wherever you might be, Bridgetown, um, and whether it's Michael Holding, Andy Roberts, Malcolm Marshall, or you know the great Indian spinners, or whatever it might be, wherever you walk out to bat, you're nervous. And if you can, my sort of attitude was, if you can sort of at least look relaxed, that helps. Because in, in a sense, it also helps you to relax physically, mentally, if you want to sort of make that make that happen. Underneath, there's all sorts of stuff going on. Depending on some days you go out there and you are genuinely relaxed and sort of things fall into place. And those are those are the great days potentially, but they can they can finish equally quickly. Other days where you just really don't feel like it or it just it feels all wrong, then you have to then in here have to work really hard. So um, I can honestly say that it was a you know it was partly true. Um, and I developed, I mean, going back to Ian, Ian has this thing where if, I mean, I once asked him a question on a stage at Lords. I said, have you ever had a moment of self-doubt? And he said, just no, he said, point blank, no. Uh, and that's his way of resetting. So if there's, been, if there's been a bad day or if he's had worries, you know, just resets, completely forgets about it. Um, I used to try and say to myself, well, okay, if you can just, if you can, um, it's almost like sort of meditation, but it, not quite. Um, if you can relax and appear relaxed, because um, it's like um, you know, showing fear to animals. They sense it very quickly. If you show fear to fast bowlers. <laughs> they, they are a bit like animals, aren't they? I mean, it's... Um, well, I, I'll, I'll leave you to make that point. <laughs> uh, but yes, you're right. I mean, it, it's, you know, if, if, you, you know, if you walk out um, against any of those guys... 
and you're you know, it's that sort of like that blazing saddles moment you know with the, the, <laughs> the, the gun hand quivering you know if, if you if your bat is quivering in your hand it's not a good look so yeah, you've already lost <laughs> you kind of yeah you have you're right absolutely right so part of it was true um and i sort of did develop a sort of a, a, an ability to say well okay i might just got out for not very many runs uh, was it my fault was it their fault was it somewhere in between sort of self-analysis um and again on bad days you are supremely self-critical you have to be so on bad days i would sulk for the rest of the day um if it was one of those days where you think well actually you know, Richard Hadley or someone's just bowled me something which I couldn't, you know, if you bowled it me another hundred times, I'd still nick it or still miss it, whatever it might be. I can accept that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, because you, you cannot afford to sort of linger on that for too long. But if you if you know you've let yourself down, then, you know, for whatever reason, then you're allowed to be supremely self-critical and have a go at yourself and sulk a bit. Um, but again, that doesn't serve any purpose if you let that go in too long. So all, all that sort of laid backness I mean it it was I mean I, I remember actually I remember going to during my hundredth test match which wasn't a great success at heading against the West Indies and um, the line was I went up to the TMS box in a rain break and was talking to Brian Johnston the great Brian Johnston and he said well, well my dear I think um, sort of a bit of cross between Brian Johnston and Blofeld he said um, what are the what are the words you'd like to have you know scrubbed from the record when it comes to people talking about you know like, like, like you know laid back that's what stuff. So well actually you know the two words I'd like to get rid of right at the moment are court dujon, <laughs> <laughs> which is happening far too often at that stage. Um, and I was well, you know, just be bold. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So right, instead of falling into the typecast dismissal, you know, um, find other ways of getting out. But it, it's in the end it serves well to be honest um, and. If you, I mean, and, and then, in fact, in the broadcasting career, which um, I hope hasn't completely um, finished, but in the broadcasting career where there are quite often lots of things going on you know, that the viewer cannot see or hear, there's things, you know, people in your ear with a bit of a panic on, wherever it might be. Um, if you can use that same sort of psychology just to sort of, you know, calm the, calm the pulse rate and you know, just allow people to relax around you and trust in them. I mean, and I was always very happy to trust those around me uh, both in the studio who would say great things and both and the other guys in the in the trucks who would be sort of controlling things to always get there before it has to be a full panic so i mean that that sort of teamwork was great to have and again just the ability just to say okay well you know what's the worst that can go wrong uh, you know there might be 10 seconds of silence there might be you know well i'm sorry i just don't know what's going on here but actually you know, that doesn't really affect the world at large. I mean, there are far more important things to worry about. So just, to, just again, to have that, that sort of uh, ability to try and steer a calm path through things was very handy for, you know, has been very handy for the last sort of, 25 years plus. I think um, there's some kind of parallels to draw, especially with um, the upcoming West Indies, England kind of test matches, because mm -hmm. they, they can't go into that w world, especially the biosphere that the ECB, of course, the created and proudly announced today that were all 700 people negative which is great yeah good. um but how how do you think that is going to go i mean the when it when it came to um the west indies um you were playing against some of the best people in the world and making sure that you were switched on all the time what was it like to kind of play against them well i um i always peddle this series that i think that west indies team or those teams of the 80s were probably the strongest teams ever to play test cricket. Um, and again, you always have to say, right, you compare um, Brabham's Invincibles 1948, that sort of thing, or the, the Invincibles 1948, the, the Aussies that followed in the 90s, you know, Border, Taylor, War, all these guys. I mean, they, they led teams that were pretty much invincible too. But the West Indies, I mean, the line is this, West Indies um, were pretty much all powerful through the 80s. If ever we had them in trouble, they found a way out of it. I mean, they had brilliant batsmen, they had brilliant bowlers. If we, if we happen to dismiss that lineup of extraordinary batsmen for something reasonably decent, you know, a couple of hundred, well, they had bowlers who would bowl us out for a lot less very quickly. <laughs> uh, and the line was always, well, they never had a Shane Warne. You know, they never had Sir McGrath. Well, they had never Shane Warne to, to, to uh, so they never needed one. You know, it's as simple as that. They kind of never needed one. Um, and that was that. So playing against them was tough the toughest thing i've done um i would say that because you're you know that that whole process of 
trying to get some sleep the night before, um, get into a ground in the morning, and you sort of look at the team sheet and you think, oh, Michael Holding, yes, he's quick. Andy Roberts, yeah, he's quick. Joel Garner, he's quick and very tall. Um, might be Colin Croft, might be Malcolm Marshall. Um, and yeah. all, all the time you're not, wear, you're not wearing a proper lid, are you? No, you but actually, to be scenario. fair, um, I, I, I mean, I tried, you know, I experimented with the early form of visor, which is that horrible Perspex thing, which was massive. You know, you're yeah, more like a COVID-19 PPE kind well, yeah, of thing. You could fucking jumbo jet in those, and that was, you know, it was ridiculous. <laughs> And I just, yeah, I just didn't like it. I felt sort of claustrophobic with that sort of thing. So I was prepared to take the risk with just the, you know, sort of the vital, the vital parts protected, um, you know, temple and sort of whatever little brain was in there. Um, and it, I remember some, I, mean, I, I certainly tried, I mean, I have experimented being hit on the head without a helmet and hit on the head with a helmet. <laughs> and as long as it's a glancing blow without, you get away with it. Um, but one or two solid blows on the side of the helmet, which I was very glad I was wearing one at the time. Mm -hmm. And there was one, I think, in the 86 series in West Indies, the Caribbean. I was going well at tea time, I think, in Antigua. It was in Antigua. And I almost toyed with the idea of putting a floppy hat on to go out for the, for the final session today. And in that first over, having put the helmet back on again, Colin Croft bowled me a bouncer, which bang, you know, clanged off the side, went down <laughs> for four leg buys, which, you know, obviously productive. And it's just, you just think, well, actually, you know, they have been a, such a major thing, you know, in a sense, very simple. Um, but we were there in Australia in sort of the late 70s, 78, when they first developed the first proper cricket helmet, as opposed to the motorcycle helmets that Dennis Amis, Tony Gregg, and these guys were wearing in World Series, which were very funny. And they did a job, <laughs> but I mean, they couldn't hear a thing. I mean, there's all these motor, you know, all the, imagine all the padding in a motorcycle helmet. It must be so, boiling hot as well. It's boiling <laughs> hot. And if someone said, yes, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you, 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 got, you got to put the visor up first. Go, oh, sorry, what did you say? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it was, that was an extraordinary era. So, I mean, yeah, so we've been very lucky that we played in an era where, um, you know, sort of the sort of the PPE for cricket became um, better, better designs, more effective, um, and of course nowadays it's just it's, it's just instinctive, or it's just de rigueur for everyone to wear a visor. Um, and obviously, I suppose if you if you have to do it and you get used to it very young or very quickly, then you realise it's you know it kind of works. And if, you know, for instance, if Alistair Cook can get you know twelve thousand runs wearing a visor, it can't be all bad. You know, it's uh, it's, it's you know, <laughs> you know, it, it obviously doesn't quite get in the way as some people fear it, feared it might. But I, I used to find it very claustrophobic being behind something. Yeah, um, just to just to bring us up to date, um, mm. then uh, obviously England do kick off a series against the West Indies in what, is it exactly yeah. two weeks or, or two weeks tomorrow? Um, do you have any thoughts on how you think that might go? Um, what, what, oh. How good do you think the current England team are? Um, I think England. I mean, I was down in Cape Town watching from the stands at the start of the year, and you can see obviously you know, there are the current superstars you know the ben stokes of this world are absolutely sublime to watch um there's a lot of pro and there was a lot of progress made on that tour so for instance that top three you'll be interested to see who they actually pick in the top three and i've got a feeling that you know burns will have you know, earned the right on his previous performances to keep his spot uh, as one of the openers uh, crawley could easily come in at three Sibley's own, you know, again, did well enough, confident, you know, competently well enough to keep his slot as an opener as well. So it might be Joe Denley who has to miss out, who, again, did a good job, but hasn't really put huge figures on, you know, into the scorecard. So you've got that. You've got Root, who is obviously a very, very fine player. You've got, you know, a very strong looking middle order, pretty good bowling attack. Um, I mean, looking at the West Indies, They've got some good bowling. I mean, they've got some pace. I mean, there's, there's a, you know, there are a couple of echoes of the past for some of the guys they've got here, who are good bowlers as well as sharp. Mm -hmm. um, so they will not be taken lightly by anyone. Um, but again, you just have to say that if you if you went through man for man, uh, even in, in these ridiculously extraordinary circumstances, man for man, you know, England should be the stronger side. But what it's like, I mean, I, I did see a comment about a month ago where. Um, you know, this, this whole thing about playing without a crowd was mentioned. And the West Indies, you know, the way they play their cricket, I mean, their test matches are played in front of 20 people. Their first-class <laughs> cricket is played in front of 10 people. 
Um, so they're kind of used to playing in empty stadiums. I mean, the only thing that works out there is the Caribbean Premier League, where they get you know, get a few people in. So it will be weird. I um, mean, I have suggested pop-up crowds, so that you know someone with a button can flick flick that button, and if someone gets fifty, <laughs> you know, twenty thousand cardboard cutouts suddenly stand up and applaud. <laughs> Um, so is that the worst game of guess who I could possibly imagine? I mean, I, mean I, I think I've got about a week or so to set this company up to support <laughs> you know, the Aegeus Bowl and Old Trafford with pop-up crowds. Um, uh, well, well, I'm in. I'm in for one. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah you've got three willing participants. Yeah. Yeah. They're doing it with the football as well, aren't they? They've got the fake crowd on, on Sky. Yes. I, like, I, just, I just like to envision someone sitting behind a mixing desk just sort of like measuring the crowds of each side you know if, yeah. if it looks close do the get a couple of crowd catches in there as well you know a little, yeah. a little knob yeah. for the crowd catch that'd yeah. be good but i mean i think um, I mean, overall of course the thing is that um it's it's you know it's we're all we're all a bit desperate that it happens um and it's good that it can happen and it's good that they've made so many you know all the right preparations as far as we can tell at this stage to make it happen make it happen successfully um, and I mean, it, it, it is a bit of a savior. I mean, let's face it, the, we, you know, there are, I suppose the critics of sport in general say, well, what's the point of sport? And yet we all know, you know anyone who's been involved in it or loved it or just, you know, has it ingrained in their systems knows that there is so much value to be taken from sport. So uh, if you're a cricket fan, you want to see cricket played. You know, even if you can't actually get to a ground to watch it physically, just the fact that it's being played gives you, um, you know, that sort of vital commodity, which is hope that things will get back to something acceptable reasonably quickly. I mean, I know mm -hmm. the one thing nobody knows is what's going to happen next. I don't care how many science degrees you've got. You know, I, I mean, I've just come from, okay, hands up, just come from a glass or two with friends, one of, you know, some of whom are doctors. You know, and they, you know, they all have their opinions about, whether you should be wearing masks, what the distancing should be, the whole thing, you know, there's a million opinions out there. Um, but no one actually really, 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 really knows the absolute answer. Otherwise, we'd have sorted that out months ago. So, yeah, just, just to get something back again, just to get something going again is crucial, I think. Um, and let's just keep our fingers crossed that we get through all being well, six test matches, without, you know, without undue drama. Absolutely. Well, hopefully there's some drama on the field, but otherwise, um, <laughs> couldn't agree more, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah a little yeah, bit of all... would be nice, yeah. It's six we're draws. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, six yeah. draws, <laughs> batting out the final day. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so, hopefully we didn't bring bring up too many painful memories by discussing the West Indies. Obviously, as, uh, as captain, you endured uh, a couple of chastening defeats at, at, at their hands um but M max twisting the knife in yeah. our special <laughs> guest. it's all right i'm going to bring i'm going to bring it yeah. back to um you know you had some pretty pretty good moments as well uh, not least um beating the aussies 3-1 yep. in, in the ashes yep. where yep. you had a pretty good series yourself as well um but we sort of we wanted to know how you felt about the england captaincy and sort of your approach your preferred style of captaining in that team yeah um yeah, that's, I, I've thought about this then, now, in between. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I wouldn't rank myself as the finest ever by any stretch of the imagination. I had, um, in terms of style, I had one, one pretty important abiding principle, which is I wanted, always wanted um, my teams to be involved. Um, so I was always very keen to encourage them to think for themselves. Um, so, for instance, team meetings, I wanted to be inclusive, not just a lecture from captain and management as to what's going to happen and you know, what time you leave in the morning, end of story. I wanted people to um, contribute. You know, if you're, going to, if, you're, if you're, for instance, in, I mean, where did I tour as captain? India, for one. Um, but if you're thinking about, right, how do we, you know, how do we operate in, in India? You know, the, the players are against us, Sunil Gavaska, that sort of stuff. You know, I didn't want to have to say, right, this is how we get Sunil out. I wanted the bowlers involved to say, well, okay, I've got an idea. Um, let's do it. And I wanted that process to be live before the game, during the game, and after the game. So, um, and part of that was, I mean, I always remember very proudly, Graham Fowler, who came on that tour of Indra 84-85, um, said to me at the end of it, he said, thank you. Because for what he felt the first time in his career, 
the captain treated him like a proper player. So it wasn't, you must do this, you can have a net at half past nine and then run around, do some catch. It was, what do you want to do? What do you need to do to be ready for the game tomorrow? That sort of thing. Uh, and therefore, I, it's one of those things I felt very strongly about, giving responsibility to players to be, first of all, themselves, to think for themselves, um, obviously to be part of a team. And in, in the end of it all, you end up with um, the captain, i.e. me, as the, the man in the end who has to say, well, okay, yes, it's a good idea, or no, it's a bad idea, or yes, we're going to do it, or no, we're not going to do it. And the only problem with that is when you're winning. So, for instance, 84-5 in India, we somehow managed to claw that series back and come back as um, winners of that series, which is fantastic. I mean, I was very, very proud of that on a tour where we had not just cricketing matters to deal with, but the assassination of Mrs. Gandhi, the assassination of Percy Norris in Mumbai, our own Deputy High Commissioner, uh, so we had huge political issues to deal with as well, and just touring India. Um, so to win that was very special. Um, I mean, the Ashes you mentioned, again, very, very special to be able to stand on the oval balcony at the end of six matches as an Ashes winning captain and as a contributor to the team. But all those things, you know, when the system works, it's great. Like any system, when it works, it's fantastic. When you come back, you go, you go from the Ashes 85 balcony, where I... The classic line was when Peter West, as the host for BBC, said, well, what about the West Indies you know, coming up uh, you know, this winter? And I said, I'm sure they'll be quaking in their boots <laughs> you know, with tongue firmly planted in cheek and that sort of cheeky grin on my face. Um, and obviously, you know, history tells us it didn't go well. But three months in the Caribbean using the same system, um, you know, basically, if you lose as badly as we did, and I mean, that was one of the bigger disappointments, coming second so badly that time. But if you if it then doesn't work, the system becomes questionable. So I mean, by the time I'd finished that tour of um, the West Indies in '86, there were been questions asked by the media, by you know, even by the selectors. Well, who's in charge? You know, because all this sort of allowing people to come up and suggest things. Even though you so even though in your heart you know okay well, it's my decision in the end, if it looks like other people are taking over, then it becomes questionable. If you're winning, no one asks the question. If you're losing, they ask the question. So I don't know if you remember when we got back to England in 1986. We'd finished in the West Indies in April, so the English summer is starting, the season is starting. The first Test matches against India in at the end of May probably, so not much of a gap. And Peter May gave me a real vote of confidence by saying, you have one test match. <laughs> so, and before, before that test match, so all this stuff sort of been echoing what had been written in the press and the rest of it. I had these T-shirts printed. I don't know if you've heard the story, but I had these T-shirts printed where one of them had, I'm in charge across the chest. And the other 11 for the rest of the squad said, I'm not. <laughs> and so in those days of course we just arrived on Wednesday the day before the Thursday start that was it you know cup of tea net catching practice job done so I issued all these t-shirts to players that afternoon and it worked I mean, again it worked pretty well it was you know the, so the message was understood and they quite enjoyed it and I think even you know, the press on the day got the joke got the joke as it were um, and so it was uh, you know, an attempt to make a sort of light-hearted response to a serious question. And the only thing I needed was to win that test match, which of course then didn't happen. <laughs> um, so you are then judged by your results. And as we were coming off the balcony at the end of that game with India winners, um, Peter had already spoken to Mike Gatting about taking over the captaincy. Um, I had the T-shirt. So when I came off, came away from doing all the interviews and the rest of it, and was tapped on the shoulder and told that was it, um, you know, no longer in captain, it's fine. So I handed the T-shirt across to Mike. Uh, and there is a photograph of me handing, you know, Mike in his <laughs> blazer, he's still in tracksuit, you know, reflecting what had been going on for the last 30, 40 minutes, handing this T-shirt across saying, I'm in charge. Um, and the line I have to use, I'm afraid, is that I had every confidence in Mike that it wouldn't fit. Anyway, um, <laughs> you know, he's, he then took over the role, as, as is the way with these things. So... Um, and you, know, you go, you see, so you go into the new era. Um, the rest of that summer was a bit up and down, um, but of course, within months we are um, in Australia, eighty-six-seven. And despite a very poor start, we, you know, four months later we come back with the Ashes, the Perth Challenge, the the B and H One Day, um, you know, trophy and the rest of it. Uh, and Mike is, you know, he's he's going well, going strong. 
Uh, so you talk about kind of like getting in kind of relationships with cricket. Um, I mean, cricket is one of those things where playing in a team with your mates is one of the best things about it. Um, who were your favourite people when you were playing for England to actually play with, and who, what made them good teammates? Um, well, Beefy is always a good teammate. Um, you have to say that, otherwise he'll hit you. <laughs> um, <laughs> but when, when you've got when you've got someone like Ian Botham in your team. You have a one, you know, a bit like sort of Ben Stokes character. Now you've got someone that people naturally look to, um, who is larger than life on the field, larger than life off the field. So you know, good to be around. We were, we I guess we were very lucky to in that sort of era, end of the seventies through the eighties, to have a little bit more freedom than maybe nowadays um, on and off the field. So you had Ian, Alan Lamb was always a great mate, um, very very fine player. Who I'm, I'm amazed actually with Lammy that. You've got all those runs against the West Indies, hundreds against the West Indies, which is a real tribute to his skills. And his overall figures sort of don't quite reflect the talent that I know he had uh, and the ability. And he was he was great to be around as well because you know we had a lot of we were different but similar. So you know, he was always very active, or you know the it's sort of the ability to enjoy the whole thing. So, you know, so the, to enjoy the 24 hours, not just maybe the cricket, not just the fact you're away and touring, you know, just to make the most of the whole thing. I think it's a very important thing when you're a touring cricketer to understand that. And um, when I first started touring, there were people like, say, John Lever, who um, you know, had the ability to um, lift people because you just had the right sort of character. You know, so the, that ability, wherever you are, you could be in sort of miles from anywhere in India and, he'd, you know, it's a bit of fun here. Um, you can be in the middle of a test match in Australia. And you sort of, you know, it's just the ability to tour well. And that doesn't just mean having raucous parties every night, you know, that's the, which is ridiculous. But you, <laughs> you know, it happens, yes, but <laughs> not every night. You know, so you just, just sort of the ability to, to um, appreciate, actually, this sounds a bit cliche, but appreciate how privileged you are to be in that position. So the responsibility is obviously to try and win, win games for England. Responsibilities to try and get the best out of yourself as part of a team trying to win games for England. Um, but as a human being, I always thought the responsibility also was to be interested where you are. Um, you know, some people, you know, some people would say that touring Australia is a doddle because it's you know, a great place to be. Um, and some people would say that, for instance, you know, 30, 40 years ago, touring India was tough because it's not the country it is today, which is much more modernised than it was then when I first went there. Um, and it was, but I always found that to me from the first day I went there, found that to be an extraordinary experience with extraordinary people. Um, and you know, if you look at the sort of the, the different cultures from you know the Antipodes um, to Asia uh, to the West Indies, you know, we didn't have South Africa on the roster in those days. Um, but I, I, I just found that fascinating. I found that very interesting and um, many quite often very humbling. Um, but just you know, adapting to so many different people, so many different situations, so many different countries has been the most extraordinary education, the most extraordinary experience. So overall, I mean, that, that's, that's the sort of thing that stands out in my mind is the, mm -hmm. you know, the absolute privilege of somehow stretching, earning a bit of a living through playing and talking about it for 40 odd years, which let's face it, it's, you've got to be very lucky to do that. It's not a bad life, is it? <laughs> It's been brilliant, and I'd like to go back to it. You know, that's the that's the <laughs> just thing. to dive in quickly. I mean, like yeah. I, I think one of the really interesting things about cricket is the way that uh, it is a bit of a melting pot, and, and and lots of different countries do have their own culture or language, or, or yeah, I mean, even within the game of cricket, way of doing things. Um, do you have a favourite place um, that you that you've toured, uh, or if you were going to recommend a place for us three to go, for instance, yeah. um, <laughs> where where would you send us? <laughs> Well, <laughs> you know, best part of an hour now. Um, I I guess it's still. I mean, I guess if you if you're only allowed to do one tour, then probably an Ashes tour. Um, because I mean, I, I've always loved Australia. I mean, there's a lot going on down there. It's ferocious cricket. Um, you know, the sense of competition on and off the field is very very strong. But actually, once you've earned their respect. Um, you know, simple, simple expedience or sort of making a hundred or two here and there, um, it becomes even better. And we have a lot of genuine friends who, you know, we've met in Aussie over the years, over the last 40 years, who will remain so for the rest of our lives. Um, in a sense, that's almost too obvious. I mean, I'd always rec I'd also recommend 
Um, and if we're lucky within months, we might be in India. I don't know. But I'd also recommend a tour of India because it is a very different sort of culture. Um, I think a lot of people, even in this sort of modern India where it's more westernized, more modernized, um, and for instance, you could do a sort of, as it were, a sort of a, a sort of um, very clean tour of India with some lovely hotels and all the rest of it. But that sort of culture around the cricket in India is extraordinary. Just the sheer numbers of people who get involved and the enthusiasm is, you have to go, you have to kind of be there to see it. Um, I mean, we, as I say, we experienced India from the early 80s onwards. And some of the places we went to, say, in 81, 82, upcountry places were very undeveloped. So you saw the, the raw side of India. Um, and that taught you a lot about yourself and your ability to cope. Um, but underlies, under, underlying all that, every, each and every time, you know, in those early days in the 80s where test cricket was everything in India, nowadays where you've, they've gone through the year of test cricket, gone to ODIs, gone to T20, gone to IPL, um, you know, sort of the football is rather more spread. But in those days, an England team would arrive anywhere in the country. Um, you know, not necessarily the major cities, but you get to somewhere like, um, you know, sort of Guwahati up in the northeast, um, which is almost in China. You know, it's the other side of Bangladesh now. You know, it's miles from the, the centre of the core of India. But you get to an airport and there'd be a crowd. Uh, you know, and they'd be sort of looking at you. I mean, I went... Um, you know, everywhere you went, outside the hotels, there'd be crowds of people just wanting to have, just, just to see you. And again, that's, that's a quite an interesting thing to get used to when you don't have that same sort of stuff going on back in this country or elsewhere. Uh, even, for instance, once one of my other great passions is, is sort of the, the, the world of wildlife and conservation. And I've used all my tours of India to go and you know, get out into the wild, try and find tiger, try and uh, do a bit of that, do a bit of, sort of Indian safari. And there's a lovely park, um, uh, Tiger Reserve called Ranthambore, which I went to as the guest of a fellow called Fatty Singh Rattor, who was a great name. And he was a great character. He wore sort of a, sort of one of those field hats, sort of a bit of zebra skin. Uh, uh, well, well, they got a pie yeah. hat. <laughs> you define people by their hats, I tell you. Um, but he was a brilliant, brilliant naturalist, brilliant conservationist, ran Ranthambore at the time. It must have been 81, 82. Um, we took the train. We actually took the train from, I think, from Calcutta, as it was then, um, all the way across the middle of India. Uh, well, in fact, you're going to Rajasthan. So, and you get off at a place called Sawai Madhapur, which is a tiny halt. And I remember sitting there on the, trying to get out of here, and there was a bit of a waiting room, and it was empty, and they very kindly sort of showed me in. There was a chair. I read my book. The train was two hours late. And just as I sat there, you think, you know, no one would know, no one would know. But actually, every minute, another face would arrive at the door. And within half an hour, there's sort of 50 people sort of coming into the waiting room, sort of because they're making room for other people. Just to look at, this is actually probably the next one, you know, to look at the England captain sitting there reading his book. <laughs> look at the hat he's wearing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, those sort of little things, just sort of, I, I just find extraordinary. I think it's, it's lovely, lovely the way they do that. Um, and in fact, on that same topic, in Calcutta in those days, 81, 82, we met this lovely couple, Bob and Anne Wright, who used to run something called the Tollygunge Club, which is still there. I was there in Calcutta, keep saying Calcutta, Kolkata, um, last year, and went back to Tollygunge. It's, it's one of these sort of um, outposts where in the midst of all the dust and heat and the rest of it, there is green grass, tennis courts, golf course, horses, um, you know, gin and tonic, the whole thing. And the ethos remains, but Bob and Anne used to run that uh, brilliantly. And we would we would sort of go from the hotel we used in Calcutta, stroke Calcutta was the Oberoi Grand, which is lovely in its own way, very, very lovely hotel. Um, but we'd go to Tollygunge for a drink and some food and you know, different company. And they were brilliant. And they had, um, because Anne was head of World Wildlife Fund, as it was then in India, and they had their own camp in Kana, which is right in the middle of the country, sort of three, four or five hour drive from Nagpur. And they invited us out one year to, you know, spend three or four days in this tented camp in Kana, which is just an extraordinary experience again. Um, and we saw, I mean, that's where, where, that's where I had the best ever sighting of a huge male tiger from the back of an elephant, you know, 10, 15 yards away. Uh, and those are the things that 
again, you talk about playing cricket, you talk about talking about cricket, you talk, you know, those are the things like that that really sort of stick in one's memory because that's a, a privilege granted only because I was an England cricketer in India, meeting Bob and Anne, being invited out to Kana, stuck on the back of an elephant and taken to within 10 yards of this most magnificent male tiger. You know, and that doesn't, you know, doesn't come easily, but it's, 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 I mean, that's, those are absolute treasures. Definitely a tiger and not a tiger moth. Oh, well, yeah, that's yeah. the link there. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I'm sold on India. I don't know about, about mm. you two. But... Well, I, was supposed to go, I was supposed to go this year, wasn't I? It's, 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 yeah. it's twisted the knife in me. I had a whole trip oh, going yeah, from Mumbai, Bangalore, Hyderabad, Chennai. Yeah. So I was going to go for the IPL. Yeah. So um, it, maybe next time. It sounds absolutely wonderful. Um, but there are, a, there are a couple of tours that you didn't go on. Um, mm. So... On a, on a bit bit of a, a serious note, um, so there were a, a couple of England Rebel tours that um, took place while you were playing, and you decided not to go on both of those occasions. Uh, was was that a difficult decision for you to make at the time? Um, it was. There was temptation for sure. I mean, the eighty, the eighty two, the eighty two tour, which was we were in India eighty one, eighty two, and there's a lot of discussions um, along the lines of, well, you know. There is this tour to South Africa being mooted. Are you interested? Yeah, talk to me. Yeah, talk to me. Um, but there was the there was the assumption at the time, especially by all those that actually did sign up, that because in those days you had two contracts. You had your county contract, which ran from April through to September, finished then, and you had your England tour contract, which started basically first day of the tour, finished last day of the tour. So everyone assumed that you were out of contract, therefore kind of untouchable. Um, I was, I think I've got to say, I was lucky that even though I listened to a few of these conversations, um, I was also speaking to people close to me who were very sensibly advised, well, you know, this is still, come on, just think about it. You know, it's still a regime which does not go down well with the rest of the world. Um, there are still very serious political issues at stake here. Um, therefore, and I was relatively young at the time, so why jeopardise or even think about jeopardising what should be a, it's never straightforward, but, you know, potentially successful career playing for England. So I said no. Um, you know, Ian likewise had discussions and probably slightly different reasons said no. And the guys that went, went thinking they were probably going to get away with it, but... Um, you know, now we know that there was enough evidence, as it were, there was enough to say, well, actually, no, you've done the wrong thing, two-year ban, take some time off. So I was very, in the end, very glad that I got the decision right, albeit with help. No, you know, I wouldn't, sort of, I wouldn't claim any sort of, um, you know, halo of my own saying, no, 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 I was so opposed to it on all sorts. You know, you just, you, you have to talk these things through and realise what's important. So, I mean, the, the politics was important, for sure. Um, and my situation, you know, selfishly, was also quite important. So the advice I got was good enough to stop me going. Um, and by the time the second tour went, I was now in the same position as Keith Fletcher had been on the first one, which is, as England captain, you are the last person to hear about a proposal for a Rebel tour. So through that, <laughs> summer, of, you know, through that summer of 89, which was, in fact, even worse than the series against the West Indies, you know, it was, it was a should have been a far more even, even series, it never was. But through that summer, I have all the people involved, so the people who were being approached to go to South Africa, like Gatt, who had been injured and left out, um, and all others who were signing up to go to South Africa, even Mickey Stewart, Ted Dexter, as England's uh, manager and, England, and chairman of selectors, you know, even they had, they knew about it before they told me about it. And I mean, I only found out at the last possible moment at Old Trafford during the test match there where we were just about to lose the Ashes with still two games to go. And it was a, a very, very low time for me. So I'm now sort of finding out that you know, something like six or seven of the players that were in that 11 had signed up and were not going to be available for the next game, which actually wasn't going to make a jot of difference to our chance of winning a game, but um, <laughs> hasn't already proven. But it, you know, that, that was the most fearful situation, you know, because you're, you know, you're just... You're just left out i mean and that's but that has to be the way because if you are planning revolution or yeah you know, sorry a rebel tour then the one person you cannot tell is the end captain so you kind of you know you just accept that as you know, as, as a corollary of the position you're in so i didn't i mean I, there was certainly no choice to be made there i i 
Yeah, I, I went out to South Africa as a schoolboy, 74, 75, um, in the midst of apartheid. And at that age, 17, 18, well, 17 years old, um, you're, you are, you're not old enough to understand, I don't think. And we went out, we were, you know, I'd say, for instance, we were hugely well entertained. Uh, the tour went very well. We played some good cricket against both uh, similar age group teams, 17, 18, against club teams. Um, and the hospitality was outstanding. You know, the old style South Africa could do that. Um, and of course, the knock on effect of that was when we went, for instance, to the Caribbean a year or two later as young England. Uh, my best mate, Chris Cowdery, captain the side that went to South Africa, captain the young England side in the Caribbean in 86. Um, the fact that we'd been to South Africa and to you know, some of the other players had also been to SA two years previously meant that we weren't allowed to go to various places. So, for instance, um, you know, we had to rearrange the itinerary in the West Indies. Uh, luckily, Barbados was still good. Uh, Trinidad was still good, um, but we didn't go to Jamaica. Didn't go, probably, I guess we didn't go to Guyana. Uh, no, we didn't. Uh, that was obviously well off the menu. Um, so, I mean, there were knock-on effects of that. And, of course, once you realise, once you learn a bit, then you understand properly what the issues are. Um, so, for instance, if you sort of fast forward to Nasser Hussein, that World Cup in South Africa, and saying, we're not going to Zimbabwe, which is yeah, a slightly different issue, but it's, it's still in the same sort of bracket as a very big political statement. I mean, that was very brave of Nasser to start with. Um, you know, they had extraordinary team meetings about that, but they, you know, they realised there was a, an extreme political situation. And they took a stand. So... Um, you know, they, I, which I think was to be applauded. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, uh, and I, and I, I think actually, um, when it comes to some of those rebel tours, the, the England, some England players and, and, and some England administrators probably didn't cover themselves in glory uh, mm. and maybe were accepted back in slightly um, too soon, particularly when you hear uh, the stories of what happened to some of the West Indian players that went... Um, around the same time. Yeah, I suppose you, you can understand why, uh, you know, for a West Indies rebel team to go to South Africa, there are extra connotations. Definitely, yeah. Um, and, you know, we could talk about that for hours, uh, especially in the current political climate. Um, and I, I mean, I, I do feel quite sorry for some of those guys who, because only on the grounds that we all expect everyone to understand every issue. And you can imagine some of those guys who went as a West Indies player on the Rebel Tours thinking, well, yeah, very similar to anyone else on a very basic level. You know, I'm representing West Indies, yeah, of a sort. I'm earning money, which is going to the pockets and you know, it's, mal it's food in the mouths of my children and the rest of it, that sort of thing. But there's some very sad tales from that. Of yes. people who came back from that and were shunned and never forgiven. But that may be... It's a, it's a lesson in the strength of feeling in the year. It's a lesson in maybe having to learn, you know, to learn about understanding issues and to maybe take decisions when they are as complicated as that with advice from people who might see the different perspectives, the different dimensions. Um, but on, you know, on a very basic level, I would sort of defend the rights of cricketers to ply their trade. I mean, you can go back to Packer. You know, again, Packer was, you know, and you think about the Ferrari to do with Packer, and that didn't involve apartheid or any of these really serious issues and governments and the rest of it. It was just about, you know, breakaway cricket and, you know, breaking away from the from the old boys' society that used to run cricket. And, of course... And for the, and for the better, as some might say. Absolutely, I'd, agree, I'd agree entirely, yeah, absolutely. I mean, although, although the, so those in power here at the time, were ultra resistant. You had the court cases, and they were shown up in court and all the rest of it. Um, even they, and, and some of those people involved then, as the establishment here, um, would have seen it and would have realised actually, yeah, there was something very powerful going on. And yeah, people like me, especially, who played in the immediate era straight after that. And you know, I got my first chance to play for England because I guess you know Dennis Amos, Tony Gregg, um, one or two others, Bob Woolmer were banned. Um, you know, so a slot becomes available, you play. And 
we all benefited from the fact that suddenly there was a bit of money in the game. Suddenly people realized that you could market the game. You know, Packer if nothing, you know, did all sorts of very, very fine things for the game. Um, and you know, the fact that you could actually market it uh, and sell it, and you know, there was actually money in cricket for some extraordinary reason hadn't been noticed for the previous hundred years. <laughs> um, so, you know, we were the beneficiaries. So, I mean, my first test match was the first thousand pound test match with money um, that's promoted by a guy called David Evans, OCS, um, who sponsored the England team that summer as a response to Packer. And of course, you know, over the years, people like Cornhill come in, did a great job. Um, and you know, so the whole, you know, the way the, way the game is run and marketed now is infinitely different and that all you're right that all stems from kerry packer having to market you know some brilliant actually i have to say and brilliant cricket it was too a lot of you know that, those first teams you know so the, the, the top 11s for australia west indies rest of the world had the best players in the world and they played they played some extraordinary cricket i mean i watched a bit i was in australia in 77 in perth and watched some of the cricket they played at gloucester park which was the ground opposite the wacker it was a trotting track, so a very small bit of grass in the middle of this trotting track. But they put a pitch in the middle of it. And I remember watching, you know, Barry Richards hooking Imran Khan out of the out of the park and thinking, God, that's extraordinary. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was brilliant. Um, so, yeah, we, we all owe a debt to them. Got it! Well, welcome back. Um, David, great so far. Um, our listeners will have different memories of you, as we've said, so as a player and as a commentator. Um, within your commentary career, you had quite a distinctive style. Um, was there anyone you were kind of influenced by? Or was there anything that you kind of went into the commentary box and you were just like, actually, this is who David Gower is? Um, I think, in simple terms, in much in the same way as style of playing was just kind of me. Um, then the style of talking about the game is very much the same. Um, I was always aware from the first time I tried it. I mean, I used to do stuff for the BBC when I stood a player, the old Nat West Semi, that sort of thing, um, and sort of build up a bit of TMS, a bit of TV, all that sort of stuff before I retired. I did a couple of winters down in Australia with Channel 9, which was very good training, uh, partly because you have to fight your own corner as a token Englishman down there anyway. <laughs> Um, but I had, you know, I had to, Tony Gregg as a bit of an ally, you know, so as a sort of half and half. But the, you know, the great people to learn from in that era, I mean, the best to learn from was Benno. So when I worked for Channel 9, Richie was, you know, the, the figure that we all know. Um, but always, always available to give advice and talk you through it. Um, people like Greg, great to be with, the Laurie, the Chapel Brothers. Um, I get on pretty well with both Chapel Brothers. I'm not allowed to say that to Ian, as in both of them, about Ian Chapel, but <laughs> you know, that, is, that is a feud that never ceases. <laughs> Even if the two of them are buried in lead-lined coffins, that feud will continue for many generations still to come. But I mean, I, I quite enjoy Chapelli. Mm -hmm. um, so I sort of blended into that team for a while, and you, do, and you, and you, are, you can only be yourself, as long, as long as you get the words out in pretty much the right order, um, as long as you're paying attention, as long as you've got something may be interesting to say or useful to say, then things carry on. So that's how that, that's how that developed. And when I came, when I retired and had, what, six years at the BBC first, again, I had people like Richie Benno there, Tony Lewis, um, you know, Tony very urbane, very, you know, very good at what he did. Um, and you could learn from all these people. And the, the bits and pieces on TMS, you learn every time you're there, you're learning something. Um, you're not everyone's cup of tea. That's one of the first things you learn. <laughs> so, you know, this style might suit some people. It'll irritate the hell out of other people. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, it's, you, you, can only, you can only back yourself. So um, the fact that it lasted this long was a pretty good sign, I think. Mm -hmm. And the fact there's what might be described as another hiatus here. Um, you know, I have to say I'm available for work. I very much like to to do a bit more of what I've done for so many years and love doing. So uh, it's just a question of finding where they, if, if there is actually a vacancy, but uh, times have changed a bit, let's put it that way. Yeah. Um, I, I, 
to some extent. Although I, I, I think I, I, I one would welcome you back onto the airways. Mm. Um, <laughs> uh, I've got a question here. This actually came from my dad um, yeah. when I when I mentioned that you were <laughs> coming on the show. So we yeah. we're all born in '92, I think. So our our David Gower reference has very be, very much been the commentary broadcaster. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, frame. He uh, rem- remembers you as a um, a cricketer um, and wonders, uh, bearing in mind how your Test career came to an end, um, whether the transition to the commentary box was, uh, whether there was a sense of relief with that, and whether you actually enjoyed the first years uh, as a commentator more than maybe the last years as a player. Um, that's just a brilliant question. I have to say that it's a very, very sort of yeah, very clever question because. Um, Last I'll let him know. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully he'll listen himself. Yeah. Um, it was inherited, or maybe not. Uh, the, <laughs> <laughs> um, the last couple of years of the playing career were up and down. I mean, at least the last season at Hampshire, I finished on a reasonably good note. Um, but there had been a couple of seasons before that which were very unpleasant. Um, you know, not very successful, lots of sort of dark moments. And what I did, the key thing I did in a nutshell was take time at the end of that 93 season, just at home, sit quietly, wondering whether or not I'd had enough or whether I should give it another go. Uh, everything was ready to go in terms of the broadcasting and journalism career, so I was ready to go. And I just, six to three said, no, fine, had enough. Um, went into, into Southampton to the uh, Northern Show Ground. Tony Baker, Secretary of Hampshire, said, I'm sorry, I'm going to retire. And all very friendly and job done. So decision made and on you get with it. So then you are away. I mean, the sort of nice thing in the sense is you're, you haven't got the ups and downs, the extreme highs and extreme lows you get from playing, um, which you can never avoid. You know, the, the great thing about the highs is they are extraordinary and they live with you for the rest of your life. The great thing about the lows or the bad thing about the lows is they also live with you for the rest of your life, you, however much you try and get rid of them. <laughs> but broadcasting is you know, much more even keel. So there were new things to learn. Um, and for instance, you know, a few years later, when I first went to Sky to present for them, you know, th- those first few months of that, first couple of years of that, you're learning that skill simply by being there. And you know, there's some terrible moments. Oh, I wish I hadn't done that. Um, but you're always, you're, I mean, that's the great thing. You're always learning. Whatever you're doing, you're always learning. So it was in a sense, a bit of a relief to get into the, the next stage of a career. And also, you yeah, really nice to know that you you can earn a bit of money from broadcasting, a bit of money from journalism. Um, you know, so the world still seemed to go around at the right, spe- the right speed. And yeah, it was still very much fun to be involved in that. And you're still, for instance, with a lot of the same people you've been working with, you know, the likes of sort of both of them, you know, Ian came into commentary boxes, others, you know, so you're, you're in the same same world. Uh, and that's a familiar world, therefore it's a safe world, therefore it's a good world. Um, but new skills needed. So I was always aware that you've got to learn those new skills. And if you don't, um, people can still take a view, you know, exactly like selectors for cricket teams. You know, if they take a view that you're not up to scratch, they can um, get rid of you. So um, the fact that it's, as I said, the fact that it survived for quite so long was was great. Um I mean, I'm, again, I'm, I'm pretty proud. I'm pretty proud of the playing days. Um, I'm pretty proud of the, the broadcasting days. Um, I know there were moments where people got upset. Um, there are moments where, you know, they're, all, they're always, in any team environment, there are going to be disagreements. But as long as you come out of it the other side strong, then that's absolutely fine. So, yeah, it has been great, um, which is one really good reason I'd like to find some ways of continuing it still. Well, I was going to say, so um, last year the words you used were kind of being retired from mm. your kind of um, Sky days, mm. um, but there's been plenty of fans calling but calling out for your return. Yep. Um, we kind of mentioned some people who um, might or might not be kind of acrimoniously on the South Africa tour earlier, and one of them recently um, vacated a position on TMS um, mm. for maybe better or worse, who knows, um, but... Is there something? Is, is there that ambition for you to get back into the commentary box, and would kind of a um, a flourishing return to TMS be of interest to you? The answer, well, the easy answer is yes, it would be of interest. And I, I mean, and it's no secret. Um, I don't think it's going to upset anyone. I mean, I, I, when we're in in Cape Town, for instance, at the start of the year, 
Um, I had dinner with Aggers, um, who is good you, start. Uh, well, it's a good start. <laughs> uh, yeah, long, you know, ex colleague at Leicestershire. Uh, well, <laughs> you know, I mean, I've known Aggers for far too long, uh, and we get on very well. I'm very fond of him, and you know, John was very supportive. He said, "Yeah, well, you know, we we you know because there is there is I think a very valid view, which is whatever you want to do with." Um, broadcasting and commentary and you know the way people portray sport all sports not just cricket and however diverse you want to be there is surely diversity should include experience so if you're going to talk um, you know and there are some very good people involved still um, but if you're going to talk about context yeah and if you're but if your memory only goes back 20 years if that's your only context having someone around whose memory goes back 40 years gives you added context. And when I was growing up and listening to the greats, absolute greats, Benno, Johnston, Arlett, Christopher Martin Jenkins, all brilliant broadcasters, all with experience, all with long memories. Um, you know, and you gradually sort of assimilate people into those teams. So you sort of feed in the next generation, but you keep the experience at the, at the back of it. Um, I think that's a very valid point. But at the moment, I mean, Jeffrey, as you were kind of alluding to, Who's you know kept you? I mean, Jeffrey is he's three thousand years old. He's you know he's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the rest. <laughs> but you know, and I've known Jeffrey for forty odd years, likewise, and you know, on a good day, I'm very fond of him. And he's you know, but he's made a you know he he made a um, a worldwide worldwide reputation, and he kept it going, which you know, is entirely to his credit. Now, um, I mean, I'm a lot younger than Jeffrey, yes, um, but in the current climate, the wrong side of a certain number. Um, and you are in the, you are in the vulnerable group when it comes to COVID. Uh, not this part. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, almost. I'm not not the ultra vulnerable group. Um, so I mean, let's I, not insult the guests, Ross. Come on. No, no, yeah. <laughs> you are in the group of people that remembered Marcus Trescothic's debut. So uh... yeah, well, I mean, well, even that, for instance, you know, but. Um, <laughs> I don't know. So I mean, I, I'd like you know. I I've tried to peddle this idea. You know, I, I did one of those um, cricket socials the BBC were doing when you know, we talk sport doing the live commentary out of South Africa. I did a day in a broadcasting house doing the social, which was lovely. It was great fun. Um, really good chats. Um, and you know, they whizzed past. And that was like a trial. You know, that was all like my sort of like my audition <laughs> to try and get back on the BBC, but. Um, I know it's been extraordinary circumstances. I know, for instance, obviously, you know, they, you know, planning for anything this summer has been almost impossible. Um, but uh, let's, let's put it this way. I would love to be around if possible. Um, and, you know, the if possible bit is the bit we're all still working on. <laughs> yeah, I think we'd all like to like to see it too, mm. to be fair. It'd be fun. I mean, um, it'd, it'd, it'd be... It's, it's it's kind of a way of life. So I mean, I, you know, but it, it's also it, it's it's the two sides. One is the, the sort of the professional side, which is I think I would have something good to say and something to add. And then, you know, whether you like that style or not, if you do like the style, well, you, you get the style. You get the way you know the way I the way I speak and the way I enjoy the game. Um, and of course, it's you know it keeps you know selfishly would keep me in the place that I'd quite like to be in the environment <laughs> I would love to stay in. Otherwise, uh, you... back to that pop-up crowd business, which you know, <laughs> <laughs> at least you've got something to fall back on, right? <laughs> uh, well, you mentioned it when we, when you were talking about uh, the broadcasting and sort of that having people around who can recall memories that sort of uh, others can't, and, and being able to bounce off each other in that way. Mm. And you've been in a pretty uh, enviable position in terms of having a long, successful career as a player, and then remaining closely involved with the broadcaster and seeing sort of the game develop from there. Mm. Um, so, I mean, I, I had a couple of questions on that. The first one, I was wondering whether, uh, how, how you thought you might have got on in the world of, uh, the current world of cricket and T20s, whether we'd be seeing you opening the batting for Sunrisers and earning the millions in the auctions. Um, obviously one would like to say that'd be a doddle. Um, <laughs> it, yes, it would have been, I mean, it, it's, I mean, the one, actually the one thing about uh, IPL and the rest of it, when they first started, as you know, it was dragging a few old Aussies out of retirement almost to give it credibility. You know, Warren played, you know, they're all, all great players. Warren, Hayden, these sort of guys, Gilchrist, um, brilliant players. 
Uh, nowadays, I think it's very much a young man's game. So if you're growing up in this environment, I mean, I've always wondered, you know, I always wonder, you know, how would I get on with the ramp or you know, all these things that people are doing nowadays? And I suppose the obvious answer to that is you would actually have to acknowledge you've got to wear a helmet with a visor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, the only man who makes makes the million dollars is the, the is your dentist. Um, <laughs> But although, you know, because we, you know, but it's, it's the same argument as ever, I think, which is whichever era you're brought up in and thrust into, you learn the tricks of the trade at that time. So my one day career for Leicestershire for England, um, you know, sort of the things I would do sometimes to create scoring opportunities, you know, backing away over extra cover were, you know, the tricks of the trade at the time. And on a good day, I was pretty good at that. Um, so, I mean, I... You know, I look back, you know, for instance, I look back at, say, the 150-odd at Brisbane against New Zealand as, you know, one of those great days. You know, everything sort of clicked into place, a little bit of luck here and there, but everything clicked into place, into place and you end up with a, you know, suitably impressive score in a one-day international. So I knew I could do that in those days. Uh, ironically, I sort of found that the will to do it seemed to sort of fade away a little bit as time went on. So the figures went down, they're not as good as they might have been but if you are brought up in this current era you know like a morgan or a butler or a stokes or you know all these guys and you've got that sort of talent and you you know i mean ben is extraordinary just the work he's put in last couple of years especially you know the sort of the reinvention of ben stokes is simply brilliant um you know he's the hardest working cricketer of all uh, possibly alongside virat Kohli. he's mighty strong he's mighty fit he trains hard practices hard and then you see what he can do on the field. Um, and for instance, that innings last year at heading in the test match was sort of the, what I thought was a really brilliant modern innings because it blends or blended together test match cricket, you know, taking three hours to get off the mark with one day cricket, smacking you know, 80, 90 runs in 20 seconds at the end of it. And it was the most brilliant exhibition of sort of blending the two cultures together to win a test match in the end. And you win a test match because of it. So, I mean, there are always, these things always evolve, but I think, you know, the, if I was 20 years old now, I'd be going, well, yeah, I'd love to have a crack at that. <laughs> I mean, you touched on it uh, really well there, actually, and sort of we were interested in seeing what you thought about where, where the game's heading. I mean, I know it's something that mm. people talk about a lot, and you've, you've probably had people ask you many times, but uh, do, you, do you think that that short format is going to be the future of cricket, or do you think they can sort of coexist and those elements of T20 will sort of make test cricket a more exciting game for people who might be wanting to get into the game? Well, I think, I mean, there's, for some years now, test, play, test players have realised that they've got to put on a bit of a show as well. Um, at the end of that, also you've got to balance that out. You know, if you go 100% to putting on a bit of a show, what they call positive cricket, and it goes wrong, and you think, well, actually, a little bit less positive, a little bit more cautious, a little bit more uh, acknowledgement of five days, and you can still win a game. Um, it's, that, it's that balance which has always made test cricket the challenge that it is. And I think there are still a lot of people who value that. Um, again, going back to Virat Kohli, you know, when India were here last and he was doing some extraordinary things, almost single-handedly keeping them in that series for a while. The fact that he would come out and say that to him, Test cricket was the most important, I thought it was the best PR you could have. Because you know, any PR coming out of India with their um, political and economic clout in this game of cricket is valuable. So Virat liking Test cricket is a very big message. Uh, and you know, likewise, you know, so the greats, Joe Root, Steve Smith, Kane Williamson, um, you know, all these guys, if they make it known that you know, they are going to judge themselves by test cricket, that is an inspiration for those who would like to follow in their footsteps. But um, I'm equally aware that there are players out there who know they'll never be test match players, who have great opportunities. And the one I always sort of think of straight away is Karen Pollard, who you know, isn't a test player. He knows that, we know that, everyone knows that, but he is a very viable commodity in IPL and in one day cricket because that's where his skills are. Um, and I have nothing against that. Um, but if someone says to me, for instance, the only thing I would have against that is someone says to me, oh, Karen Pollard's a great player. I'd say, no, hang on a second. Um, can you qualify that immediately and add in, bracket, in one day cricket? Because I don't think you're a great player unless you can master all formats. You know, so those names I mentioned just now, 
who are brilliant in you know, whatever, whether it's 20 overs, 50 overs or five days, then those are the great players of the modern era. Um, so at least, I mean, I think it's good to have the variety, good to have the opportunity, good to have all those many ways of entertaining your public. Um, we still don't know what the hundred is going to be like. And we'll have to wait at least another year for that, maybe. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a... There's always going to be change, you know. There's, there's, we we have to we have to accept there is change in everything. I mean, not just cricket, but around us there are changes happening ever more rapidly. So you can't just sit there quietly you know, in your eco secure bubble thinking it's <laughs> going to be the same for the next fifty years. So what, you mentioned the hundred. So what do you think about the hundred? Because I mean, the ECB have done their best to make it sound like a bad idea, but then there is there is complete uh, what's the word kind of positivity in trying to galvanise interest in the game. So what, what are your thoughts around it? Well, I mean, I know some very good people who are very enthusiastic about it. Um, obviously, those at ECB are the most enthusiastic about it because it's their, their product. They need to sell it. They need to make it work. And they see, um, you know, again, in this ever-changing world, they see value in it, which I, I mean, I can be as sceptical as the next man about, for instance, where this brand new audience is going to come from. It's going to suddenly flock to the hundred as opposed to anything else. Um, okay, maybe that's an exaggeration in terms of what they're actually trying to do there, but um, trying to broaden the audience is obviously in principle a very, very good thing. Um, in practical terms, you know, 100 balls versus 120 balls isn't a huge difference. Um, and if it becomes a product which, um, you know, if as for instance, um, the hierarchy at ECB reckon is you know, becomes something they can sell, and then great. You know, we have an asset that was you know, starts as ours. Whereas, for instance, when it go back 10, 11, 12 years now, the you know, IPL at the outset was possibly a joint venture, which we got wrong. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I for one, I think Eng English cricket would be much better if Alan Stanford actually stayed outside of prison. It could have been. <laughs> You, you might you might find yourself in a minority of that. <laughs> and there are lots of people who have absolutely no interest in cricket who have a lot of interest in Alan Stanford, who <laughs> maybe quite like him to be released, but for a rather different reason. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, just moving on to, uh, to to kind of wrap things up, I suppose. Mm. Um, what you're up to now? Um, I saw on Twitter the other day, uh, David, that you are the mm. new president of the Lords. Taverners. Yep. Um, what does that entail and, and how did you end up in, in that position? Well, um, at the moment, I've described this role as uneventful. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are no events. It's as simple as that. Um, I, well, I, was, I mean, I was introduced to Lords Taverners when I first started playing for England, really. And so you're going back 40 odd years here. And it has, you know, it's an organisation with a lot of history which those you know, know that it started in, the, in literally in the tavern stand at Lords with actors, cricket lovers, um, and that sort of synergy between the different worlds, between the world of cricket, TV, stage, theatre, um, film, in fact, anything now. I mean, there's, there's, you know, it's been so long that you kind of forget what the origins were, but the, the charity has grown and grown and grown. There have been some very, very eminent people who have been president before me. I mean, I'm taking over from... Sir Trevor MacDonald, who took over from Sir Michael Parkinson. Um, <laughs> Sir Tim Rice is a you know, great friend and a former president. You know, the Duke of Edinburgh has been a former president. Um, you know, there's a long list of very eminent people, so they've now sort of scraped the barrel and come down to me. <laughs> well, maybe you're in line for an upgrade from the OBE. <laughs> well, there is a, that is another I, I'll be mentioning that. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or you're just keeping the seat warm for Alistair Cook. I don't know. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, really, yeah. Well, there you are. That's right. Or, or Strauss, or, you know, so many of these neo nights. Um, but no, so, so, I mean, I've, I've known the Tavernus for a long, long time. I actually, one of these things, you end up, you know, sort of, you sort of kind of do a bit for them, and then you, you sort of let it pass. And the last two or three years, I've become much more active with them. And we, were, apart from the going to the Cape Town Test Match, we were in Cape Town in March. And they have, well, one of the great things they've developed in the last decade is this table cricket, which... They have for their, you know, for the disadvantaged and disabled, the disabled kids especially, who mm -hmm. cannot walk onto a cricket field. We have a table tennis table with a rim, with a, basically a wall around it, little bats and balls. And if you ever see the way these guys play it, it is with the utmost enthusiasm and the utmost joy. So things like that, 
which they promote heavily and very successfully and are brilliant. Um, you know, they've added into the portfolio. So all sorts of things the Taverners are doing, which are still very, very good. And we went to Cape Town to promote table cricket on Table Mountain. Absolute genius. Um, because, you know, apart from anything else, we were delighted to go to Cape Town. Uh, to do it. And I actually got the pads on. I mean, I wasn't planning to, but I, you know, Paul Pritchard, who captains the eleven, um, said to me one night, we just you know, had a few drinks and a you know, nice part of Bishop's Court and... The game was due against was due the following day against Western Province Cricket Club, and he said, "Lubo, mate, he said, we love it. You just got the pads on. I've always dreamed of opening the innings with you." And I thought, "No, nope, not going to happen." The following day, <laughs> there I am walking out with Pritch, pads on, um, pretending, you know, just turning the clock back. I can honestly say that it was not the best five I've ever made. <laughs> uh, and if the um, if if it hadn't been you know, what the game, it was the umpire should have given me out first ball. I missed the first ball. Would have been LBW anywhere else in the world. <laughs> and when I hit one four, just I was just honestly starting to get the hang of it and remember how it works when I nicked one back onto the stumps and had to walk off again and stop for next another half hour. That sounds like an all too familiar story. I'm, I'm afraid, afraid of it. <laughs> I'm afraid. <laughs> but the but just being involved with them has been great fun. Uh and so, you know, with Trevor Sir Trevor due to retire, you know, his his time in office was coming to an end. Um someone said, Well, would you like to take over? So, well, yeah, I'd love to. So it's yeah, it's a very it's it's a it's a great charity. Um, it's a good position to hold. I mean, obviously the work is done. You know, the bulk of the work is done by those that, first of all, support the charity and those in the in the office day by day, day after day who run the charity. But it's in it's in good shape. It's in good health. Um, good reserves of cash at the moment, so they can carry on doing their projects. But now, without having to worry too much yet but obviously we need everything to open up we need to get the you know, the big dinners going again uh, the games of cricket all the things they do to raise their money we need to get going with that and when that starts to open up again then i then it will indeed become eventful mm -hmm. so i'm looking that, that i am looking forward to yeah hopefully it's not too long away indeed uh, yeah. <laughs> um I think that's nearly i think that's everything we've got for you david it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show um, is there anything that you would like to talk about or mention um, before before we wrap up? Um, I don't know. I think we've covered an awful lot of, of ground in a very relaxed fashion, which I'm very glad about. Um, I mean, I suppose so if, if it were a sort of, I don't know, summary, um, the fact is I am very happy the way things have gone for so long. Um, I made... It was pretty obvious I was a bit miffed at the end of last summer that the Sky thing was coming to an end. Um, and I was very sad, actually. I have to say, I was, uh, that final day at the Oval, um, we, I mean, they were very generous with a uh, presentation to Beefy and I, very generous with an extraordinary meal with some extraordinary wine at Beefy's favourite Spanish restaurant, Cambio de Tercio, <laughs> in the middle of London. So we had a big night there. But I was very sad because... Um, you know, the, the obvious thing is, you, you know, when you've got something like that in your life, you you don't want to give it up. Um, and yet you have to accept that, you know, the selectors have spoken. So at the moment, it's all quite relaxed. Um, when I run out of money next week, I'll be, <laughs> um, you know, I won't run out of wine yet. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the, the fact is, we saw, you know, so for instance, that was one reason why, for instance, the Lord's Tavernus thing is a good thing to have, because... There is, you know, something to do, something valid to do. Um, but I'd love to get back into commentary. I'd love to find, you know, things to do that are both interesting and productive. Um, there are one or two other projects which uh, were branching out away from the cricket towards the wildlife again, which are also on hold because we can't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm hoping that, as as everyone else is in their own way, you know, that, that as things open up, there will be more opportunities opening up as well. But, you know, the link, the cricket has been very much a a vital part, focal point of my life for so long that I wouldn't want to walk away from it. So here well, I am. Thank you. <laughs> thank you ever so much for sharing. It's been absolutely amazing having you on the show and um, thank you very much. Well, pleasure. Nice to talk to you all and I'll just say good luck with the good luck with the next one and good luck with the one after that and good luck with the one after <laughs> that. And, you know, let's 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 hope that you know very soon there will be some live cricket or some you know, actual cricket to talk about as well. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. Thanks, David. All right. Okay. All of you take care. Jacinda Ardern. Peter Jackson. Helen Clark. 
Sonny Bill Williams. Flight of the Concords. Edmund Hillary. Can you hear me? Edmund Hillary. You boys took the hell of a beating. You boys took the hell of a beating. Thank you ever so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed the interview with David Gower. We certainly did. Um, as always, you can find this on Twitter or Instagram at the Cricket Pod, or email us um, on thecricketpod at gmail.com. Thank you for listening.